Hello everyone! I'm Lady Sylvine and welcome to my realm of purpose. Just want to say a head start, I'm still recovering from a cold, so that's why my voice sounds a little bit weird. I wanted to kickstart the new year with something I really needed a while ago, but just couldn't really find anything for. At least nothing that would cater to my hyper-focus, hyper-detail, crazy way of gathering information. So here it is. A beginner's guide to the Dragon Age novels. Everything you need to know before picking up the novels. Spoiler free, of course. So to make this easier, here's a summary of everything I'll be covering. A quick overview of the books, the chronological order of them, what they have in common, how they differ from one another, and then just a couple of warnings concerning the content of the books. And then we'll go into the books themselves. So the topics that'll be included within those sections will be what the book's about, how long it is, what the general genre mood slash vibe is, who the main characters are, when the events of the book take place, how it ties into the games, the highlights of that book, the downsides, and then just some final thoughts. Without further ado, let's begin. As of January 2024, there are five novels. It's worth mentioning that there are two other Dragon Age books. Hard and Hightown, which is a book written by a character in the games, which was then made into a real world book with some extra things added in there. You can just read the codex entries for that book, honestly. And then there's To Winter Nights is an anthology consisting of 15 short stories that take place at the end of Dragon Age Inquisition's Trespasser DLC and Dragon Age Dreadwolf. This video concerns only the novels, so those two books will not be included. Back to the novels I will be covering. The Stolen Throne was written by David Gator and published in March of 2009. The Calling was written by David Gator and published in October of 2009. Asunder was written by David Gator once again, and published in December of 2011. The Masked Empire was written by Patrick Weeks, and published in April of 2014. And Last Flight was written by Leanne Michel, and published in September of 2014 two months before Dragon Age Inquisition was released, and at least ten years before the release of Dreadwolf. From the oldest events to the newest. The Stolen Throne, which took place before Dragon Age Origins. The Calling, which is a sequel to The Stolen Throne, and also takes place before Dragon Age Origins. Asunder and the Masked Empire take place around the same time about a year before the events of Dragon Age Inquisition. In Last Flight, half of the story takes place centuries before the events of the games and books, but the other half takes place during the events of Inquisition. All of the books act as preludes to the characters and events in the games, base game as well as DLC content. The Stolen Throne and The Calling act as preludes to Dragon Age Origins and some aspects of Dragon Age 2. The Masked Empire and the Sunder set up Dragon Age Inquisition. And Last Flight is the exception so far, but I bet my last sovereign that it's setting up something for Dragon Age Dreadwolf. All of the books are written in the third person in past tense, though there are a few deviations in the tense. So, for example, he had no idea where he was going. Only his urge to flee guided a step. All of the books have multiple point of view characters that change with new chapters and, depending on the book, mid chapter. Every book takes place in a different setting with different events and different characters, with the exception of the Stolen Throne and the Calling and they take place during different time periods, with the exception of Asunder and the Masked Empire. And the books also differ in mood, 
slash genre. So each novel has a unique ambience. They all read differently and leave you with a different taste in your mouth, so to speak. So it's not the same experience over and over. These books are amazing reads and insightful as hell, but keep in mind that they contain subjects that you might find disturbing or upsetting, given that these are hard fantasy fiction novels. I don't want to spoil anything, but expect the usual trigger warning content. It doesn't indulge in it, I'd say, but it certainly doesn't shy away from darker subject matters. Or tragedy. <laughs> if you're going into the novels looking for extra lore that wasn't included in the games, I suggest taking whatever lore you do find with a grain of salt. Unless it's backed up by some other content or media, because some of the things in the novels aren't backed up by any other lore, or they got retconned, or they were simply discarded or forgotten as concepts, especially with the first two novels since they were written and published before the games were ever released. Stolen Throne by David Gator In a land controlled by fear, and struggling to command a formidable army, Merrick's only allies are the outlaw Loghain and Rowan, the beautiful warrior maiden promised to him since birth. Surrounded by spies and traitors, Merrick must find a way to not only survive, but achieve Ferelden's freedom and the return of his line to the Stolen Throne. Three hundred and eighty-nine pages long, at about 120,000 words, so it takes about 10 hours to read at an average pace. It's a hard fantasy action drama, I would say. It's suspenseful and dramatic, with a hard-hitting sense of realism in times of war, with an emphasis on the strain it places on personal objectives and interpersonal relationships, as well as the difficulties of choosing between happiness and duty and survival. There are four point-of-view characters in this book. First, there's Marek Theron, the rightful heir to the Ferelden throne, Logan Mactier, Logan before he became that Logan, Rowan Guerin, the sister of Eamon and Tegan Guerin, and Severin, the mage advisor to the Orlesian king currently occupying the Ferelden throne. The events take place during the final years of the Blessed Age, the century preceding the Dragon Age. Specifically, the novel starts in 896 Blessed. 34 years before the events of Dragon Age Origins, which was named Fairy Dragon, and 45 years before the events of Inquisition, named 41 Dragon. It sets up the political backstory for Ferelden, and mainly it's just insight for Loghain's past and why he acts the way he does in Origins. For the most part, there is a lot more going on. The tone for the book is very consistent, I would say. It contains interesting lore and perspective of characters like Loghain, to a lesser degree Flemeth. It's a solid story all round, beginning, middle and end, but I wouldn't say well paced. I think that's rather subjective, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the free acts of the story. They're pretty well written, actually. Well, I just have one downside to point out, and that's just some parts drag on a bit too long and feel unnecessary. But as I said, that's subjective, so... It feels... It feels the most Dragon Age Origins-y, if that makes sense. Out of all the books. Like, it takes itself seriously with its characters and story, but not to the point it's all business and no pleasure. A lot of love went into it, clearly, and I found myself caring for all of the characters, especially someone who wasn't a main character, but she was around the main characters a good deal. If you've read the book, you know what I mean. There's just a human touch to exploring love and war and betrayal, and all the nuances surrounding it, with a hint of that unique Dragon Age flair to it. In saying that, this is 
probably my second least favourite of the novels. Which, yeah, sounds weird considering how well I've complimented it, but I've liked all of them for the most part. The only thing I would say is it's probably the most vanilla fantasy of the lot. It's got the least Dragon Age-ness to it, if that makes any sense. The Calling by David Gator After 200 years of exile, King Marek has allowed the legendary Grey Wardens to finally return to Ferelden. But they bring with them dire news. One of their own has escaped into the Deep Roads and aligned himself with their ancient enemy, the monstrous Darkspawn. The Grey Wardens need Marek's help and he reluctantly agrees to lead them into the passages he once travelled through many years before, chasing after a deadly secret that threatens to destroy not only the Grey Wardens, but also the kingdom above. This one is 452 pages, at 140,000 words, so that'll be around 12 hours of reading at an average pace. It's a thriller tragedy. It's sad and disturbing. This isn't a story about heroism in the greater good. It's about confronting mortality and finding peace in hell. There are five point of view characters. Marek, now King of Ferelden. Duncan, yes that Duncan, but during his first year of being a warden. Fiona, Yes, that Fiona from Inquisition, back when she was a warden. Genevieve, a senior Grey Warden leading the group into the Deep Roads. And Bregan, the Grey Warden they are hunting for. In 910 Dragon, ten years after Ferelden regained independence and Marek became king. Twenty years before Dragon Age Origins and 31 years before Dragon Age Inquisition. It works as backstory for characters like Duncan and Fiona. It explains how Alistair came to be, and the nature of his parentage. It sets up an important character in the Awakening DLC for Origins. It gives a realistic view of the Wardens and their trials and burdens. And especially how being a warden is probably one of the worst things you can do to a person. Like, you really feel it in a way I can't describe without telling you the entire plot and the highlights of it. It's enchanting in the most disturbing way. Reading about characters in the games you meet briefly, it really makes them stand out in the games when you know what they experienced. I know when I replayed Origins after reading this book, the Battle of Ostigar hit a lot harder than it did before I read the book. It's a very long novel, and I certainly felt it at times. There's this main point of view character romance that felt very forced, and the results were very wishy-washy. In fact, I would say, in all of Gator's books, there's an awkward romance kind of shoved in there. I think in this book it's the most overtly out of place. While it's a long novel, and you do feel it at times, I would say this one challenges one other book for first place on my personal ranking, and that rests solely on the payoffs later on. The degree to which I ended up caring for the characters snuck up on me, especially when the climaxes of their individual stories appear. It's a story about a group of untrusting strangers travelling into the depths of hell together. And it's both horrific and tragic in what they come to realise about themselves and one another. Definitely worth a read. Asunder by David Gator The destruction of Kirkwall's Circle of Magi has brought chaos to the lives of mages and templars throughout Vedas. In the majestic White Spire, at the heart of the Templar power in Val Rayo, Tensions have reached the boiling point. The Seekers, a powerful and secret segment of the Templars, arrive to take command and restore order no matter the cost. To make matters worse, a mystical killer stalks the White Spire's halls, 
invisible to all save one lone mage. As Wraiths is the only one who can see the killer, he is drafted into an expedition travelling deep into the western wastelands of Orlais. There, his fate will become entwined with that of a beautiful Templar, a tormented soul, and Wynne, heroine of the Blight. Together, they will uncover a secret far greater than they imagined, one that will change the fate of mages and Thedas forever. This one's 411 pages long, at 127,000 words, so that'll be around 11 hours of reading at an average pace. It's a mystery drama adventure. It's tense and it's vaguely mysterious. There's three point of view characters in this book. Cole, yes, that Cole. Reese, a mage. And Evangeline, your new favourite Templar. And there is one chapter from the point of view of Lord Seeker Lambert. They take place in the autumn of 940 Dragon, 40 years after Ferelden regained independence from Arlesian occupation. It takes place in tandem with the Mast Empire. Both books refer to one another's events as if they're just happened or are currently happening. Nine years after the Archdemon Arthemiel was slain, and the Fifth Blight ended. So about ten years after Dragon Age Origins, and a year after Kirkwall's Chantry was blown up, and a year before the events of Dragon Age Inquisition. It officially gives closure on what happened to Wynne, given that the last we heard of her was she was vaguely travelling with Shale at the end of Origins. It shows us the consequences of the domestic terrorism that took place in Dragon Age 2. It sets up the whole Mage Templar conflict we see in Inquisition. And its backstory for Cole, and how he ended up how and where he is when we meet him in Inquisition. Cole. Any scene with Cole is just instantly the best part of the novel. He is a bit different to how he acts in Inquisition, but that is because he has two different writers in that regard. But he's just so compelling to read about because the narrative is very... It has a very unique narrative compared to the other point of view characters, and it's just an absolute delight to read about, especially since it's a very unique perspective. It gives a better insight into how the Mage Templar conflict began and why things got as bad as they got. It paints a pretty clear picture on why the rebellion had to happen but it, it's not a one-sided story. It goes into detail about why things are the way they are, but also why they shouldn't be why they are. It's nice to see both perspectives of the argument, but it definitely leans towards one over the other. There's also a great amount of insight into magic, spirits, demons, tranquility, and Templar abilities. Like The amount of stuff I learned lore-wise in this book was mind-boggling, honestly. It's worth the read for that. A lot of the book is... well, it, it's boring, honestly. Now, that's of course my subjective opinion, but it's an interesting read with a good chunk of filler added in there. A majority of the book is the characters getting from point A to point B. And I won't say nothing happens in that time, but there's a lot of nothing that happens. And there are parts that drag on far too long. The book just feels like the good parts are just waypoints between all of the bad. This is probably my least favourite of the novels. It sacrifices a degree of the human touch in a story in exchange for interesting lore. And while that lore is absolutely fascinating, it's just tucked behind pages upon pages of not over description, but just nothing really happening. A good part of the book is the characters travelling, and the plot events are few and far between. I'd argue the same with the calling, but at least the calling tried to focus on the characters and how they were dealing with a life and death situation. The story, it feels like a personal quest that's been dragged out 400 pages. The stakes don't feel high, the characters 
don't really want anything. At least the main point of view characters don't really have that fear versus desire inner conflict. The plot is their agency. It's other characters that are telling them to go from point A to point B. So it just feels very non-committal. I will say that the mystery that unfolds is interesting. And you do end up caring about the characters. The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks Alliances are forged and promises broken as Selene and Gaspar battle for the throne of Orlais. But in the end, the elves who hide in the forests or starve in the alienages may decide the fate of the Masked Empire. This one is 374 pages at 116,000 words, so that's about 10 hours of reading at an average pace. It's an adventure drama with a lot of intrigue drizzled throughout. There are four main point of view characters. Briala, the city elf from the Halam Shural quest in Inquisition. Empress Selene, the Empress of Orlais. Grand Duke Gaspard, the rightful Emperor of Orlais and cousin to Selene. And Michel de Chavin, Selene's champion and bodyguard. And there are three one off point of view chapters. Felisan, an elf and an old friend of Briala. Lemet, a city elf. And Thren, Lemet's friend, also a city elf. The events of this book take place in tandem with the events of Asunder, as both books refer to one another's events as if they are currently happening or just happened. It's been nine years since the Archdemon Arthemiel was slain and the Fifth Blight ended. A year after Kirkwall's Chantry was destroyed, and a year before the events of Inquisition. It's essential backstory for the quest Wicked Eyes and Wicked Hearts, where you go to Halam Shiral. I'd say it's an important enough book that it's a must read before playing Inquisition, if you care all about that quest, because it completely changes the context of that situation. It's also got some, let's say, heavy lore implication for elves, city Dalish and ancient. But overall, the book sets up how the conflict and civil war in Orlais, as displayed in Inquisition, started. It's pretty awesome. The characters are all incredible, both in how enjoyable they were to read about, as well as just how well written they are. The journey they all go on, how surprised you'll be by what character is capable of what action, and what they reveal about themselves, is just incredible. If you like elves, this is the book for you. It gives so much insight into the finer details and mentalities of Sittish, Dalish, and yes, even ancient elves. You learn a lot about their cultures and how they interact with other cultures and one another. The court intrigue in mind games and politics are delicious. Felisan, in any scene he's in, he's the MVP and I love him. He takes this book to another level. Emshel, that one demon you find in Suladin Keep and in Proust de Lyon. He was a delight in this book. I'm not usually a fan of action sequences in the written form, but Weeks did a really good job of making fight scenes cohesive and entertaining, without them going into the realm of, this is impossible, no one could do that. Especially for scenes involving magic. It's really impressive. Overall, the book was really well paced. There was no point where I was bored or finding myself wanting to skip over anything. Some of the sentences don't read well. What I mean by this is some of the sentences aren't clear in what they're trying to say, or they just didn't make sense structurally. This is a pretty rare occurrence, but it did interrupt the flow of a scene at times, and took me out of it. 
Now, the only other criticism I can come up with is that there are no characters I found myself hating, or even disliking, like the other books. All of the novels usually have someone you're meant to go, that's the bad guy. But everyone seems pretty empathetic and likeable, or they were simply unimportant to the story. Now, I know that's a weird gripe, but I just think everyone was written to be liked a bit too much. This is probably my favourite of all the novels, for what that's worth. If you love elves, you'll adore this book. While it centres around the politics of Orle, I'd argue it's just as heavily focused on elven lore, and it's very insightful into the free variations of elves we're familiar with. I really appreciate how Weeks shows the rougher side of how they all view one another. The Dalish really get shown to be arseholes in this, and you can tell why Solus hates them. I mean, it's understandable why everyone acts and thinks the way they do, but it's nice to know the writer wasn't afraid to go in that direction, given how positively a chunk of the fandom regards them. The characters were all great to read. There wasn't really a moment where I wanted to stop reading, especially any scene with Felisana in it. And the finale of the book was bloody phenomenal. There's this scene that concludes what they end up looking for, it was just a peak reading experience. In my head, music was playing, I could see everything happening cinematically. I had to pause just to take in that whole scene and how well deserved it was. I 100% say you should read this, for lore as well as for entertainment. Last Flight by Leon Merchel the Templar Order, once the sworn protectors of the Circle of Magi, are murdering and harming mages across the land. Seeking haven with the Grey Wardens, Elf Mage Valia joins a caravan to Weishaupt, where she stumbles onto an ages-old secret diary from the infamous End of the Fourth Blight. Reading it, Valia falls into the tragic story of Asaya, another elven mage. A fierce Grey Warden and the lost to history twin sister of the hero Garahel, who sacrificed himself to end the fourth blight. Asaya once kept the now extinct griffins, watching and caring for the trained mounts and their empathetic warrior companions, a noble task. But her dreams of protecting Fadus from the ever encroaching threat led to a perilous decision, and her name has been shrouded in secrecy ever since. Asaya's tale winds deep into Valia's heart, and now the fate of Fadus may just rest in her hands. This one is 281 pages long, at 90,000 words, so it's about 8 hours of reading at an average pace. It's a historical action drama. The mood I'd describe as somber, harrowing, and pretty grounded. The best way I can describe the overall vibe of this book is it's a literary docudrama about griffins in the fourth blight. So this book only has two main characters. There's Valia, an elven mage in the present, and Isaia, the twin sister of Garahel, who is the hero of the fourth blight. Valia's perspective takes place in 941 Dragon during the events of Inquisition, and obviously after the events of the other four books. And Isaiah's perspective starts back in 512 Exalted, and continues over the years of Fourth Blight, so 400 years before the events of the games. Valley's point of view refers to the Mage Templar conflict going on during Inquisition. But for the most part, it concerns finding out about the past rather than talking about the present events, though there are moments where she interacts with other characters who are essentially refugees of the Mage Templar conflict. While it does take place during the events of Inquisition, and certainly refers to the events of that, I do think this book will tie into Dreadwolf more so. In reference to Inquisition, the closest you get in terms of how it ties into that is that these are the main group of wardens, as opposed to the offshoot you see in Inquisition, you know, the one led by Warden Commander Clarell. Issei's point of view is more so a look into the past and what actually happened when the Grey Wardens had griffins. 
It's pretty cool. The pacing was great. Not as great as The Masked Empire, but it's pretty good. It was never too over the top, nor did it delve into the realm of underwhelming. Scenes were written just right. The horrific context of the fourth flight was great. Felt like a dip back into the stolen throne, the calling books, in terms of depicting unsurmountable odds and tragic heroes. There is no forced romance in this one, and all of the relationships felt genuine and steadily paced. It really makes you appreciate the characters as people trying to cope with their situations. The Griffins. I loved them. They were perfect and resplendent, and did you know that they're just big cats with wings and a beak? Did I mention I love them? All of the characters were great. I can't fault any of them in how they were written. The payoffs were well deserved. It pulls punches and moves on, and I mean that in a good way. Like, in times of war you can't really afford to dwell on a thing, not if you want to survive, and that felt natural. The story beats were very much, this is done, good, right, next thing. And finally, that last chapter, that last chapter, man. Whew. I will admit some of the writing did feel wishy-washy. What I mean by that is it reads differently to the other four books. And I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I suppose that depends on who's reading it. It's definitely noticeable in terms of the writing. The back and forth between the two narratives might throw you off a bit, since they're following two semi-related but completely different stories that take place in different time periods. But I thought it worked kind of well, but I can understand that it might throw you off in the flow of reading a narrative. It was a unique and insightful experience. While the drastic shift in narrative might come across as disorienting to some, I feel like it works in the book's favour. It's kind of cool to go between the calm of the present to the horror show of the fourth flight, and it gives room for a much needed breather when things get too crazy or too static. And a final, final thought. There's a reward for you at the end of this novel. Are they worth reading? Whether you enjoy Dragon Age as a franchise or not, I'd say yes. I recommend all of them actually. While there are some I prefer over others, there's not one of them that I'd say don't read this. Each of the books has something to latch onto and care about and enjoy. The best part about them is the fact that you get a story and characters that aren't limited by technology, as the games are at times, let's face it. I can probably make the same argument about any book, but as a fan of Dragon Age, it really does help to get a better view of the lore and storytelling when the writers aren't forced into a corner because of things like, well, animating this scene would be difficult, if not impossible, or this bit of information would be hard to convey with subtlety, given the format, or this scene for this character doesn't work well because there's another character in this game that's kind of like that based on the player's choices. It's just a very liberating experience overall, as a fan of the series. And that's all I've got on the novels. While I would recommend reading them chronologically, since it's how I read them and I feel good about having done that, you don't necessarily need to. It's a large undertaking, I understand that. So if you want a quick what's good to read list, here's my personal ranking of best to worst. The Masked Empire. The Calling, Last Flight, The Stolen Throne, and Asunder. Of course, feel free to read whatever and whenever. It's entertainment after all. I think I've made a decent guide to the novels for you to make an informed decision on how to approach them. I know it was pretty daunting for me when I first got into them. And that's all I've got for today, guys. I hope this helped you, and thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe for more content. Until next time!